Welcome. My guest today is geobiologist Rory Duff. Hi, Rory, and thank you for joining me with Wisdom Keepers of Earth. Hi, Melinda. Thank you very much. So before we get started, I want to understand what geobiologist means. Can you give us a quick rundown on that? Yeah, it's a very quick description, actually. It's the study of how the Earth affects life. Well, that's That's neat. Yeah. All life, so, animals, plants. All life, yeah. What does the earth do? It affects the way we live and how we live and uh, ourselves, our bodies, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a variety of ways it can do this, but uh, there's a particular area that I'm interested in, is that is the, that, uh, well, the inner core of the earth, the solid inner core, sits within a liquid outer core. And it would appear that because of the mechanical properties of the nature of the inner core, it expands and contracts because it behaves like a transducer. And and when it it receives energy, it transduces it to another form of energy. And in particular, uh, it's very, very low spherical vibrations. And and these, just like a a sound wave uh, echoes by coming off a cliff, it's a high pressure, low pressure field. And the high pressure goes out and then comes back off the cliff. But it's the same with the vibrations. Every time the inner core expands, it sends out this high pressure wave spherically. And and due to the nature of, of spherical high pressure waves on the surface, they're represented in a linear way. And it, it would appear that these linear concentrations of high pressure are linked with the the alignments, the lays, the ley lines, and their pairs of Earth energy lines. And where they intersect, uh, the nodes, for me, what was interesting is that that was always where both ancient and modern places of prayer and meditation were found. That indicated that it's more than just spherical vibrations, vibrations itself had to be something more meaningful. And I've been very fortunate to have spent 15 years with an amazing engineering physicist called Ron Pearson, who spent 24 years of his life coming up with a new theory on the creation of the universe. Uh, It had the side effect of actually explaining how intelligence arose uh, uh, in the very early stages and and that directed waves of vibration uh, in ways to form the larger quantum worlds. So vibration and universal consciousness were forever inextricably linked. So where you have these spherical, very low frequency vibrations, that's a source of consciousness. And so when you find people meditating and praying on these intersections, they're tapping into the universal consciousness and, and in both directly and indirect ways. And, and that's why we find uh, the very strange situation where some places on Earth are sacred. And from a geologist is where I started. I thought, well, why? Why do geologists, why would they find some places to be sacred and others not? Uh, in fact, that's the same um, quandary that, uh, that I write about in, in, the, in the novel The Grail Hunter. So if you want a nice, easy way into geobiology, uh, you could read that one. <laughs> but uh, that's essentially uh, we're looking at uh, the study of, of uh, where these energy lines and their different frequencies reside and, and, and their effects on, on animal life and our life. And, and, and indirectly, it affects our consciousness, our very being, and, and what we can do, both in, in positive and, and in not so positive ways. So, so that's it. <laughs> how, how have you how have you seen how it's affected animal and plants in particular? Is there a particular growth spurt that happen, or have you noticed a pathway, perhaps the way the plants are growing, or how animals might respond to this? Um, there are subtle observations in, in lots of ways. I can name one or two. Yes, uh, it, it, for, for starters, the, the lines are what we call them, but essentially they're corridors of high pressure energy, uh, w- which sit within a, a low pressure environment. So they're all a f- in a field of energy, except that the, the lines are the high pressure elements of it. They go up into the air a, a while and down into the ground, just like the earthquakes travel through through the earth. Uh, it's the same vibrations travel through. So w- what we find on, on uh, with the animals, when, when I've been dowsing years ago, I would uh, track these lines through fields and, and um, typically I would find 
for instance, a herd of deer, uh, all sitting down and, and, and basically coming together, and they would actually be on one of the powerful lines. They would choose that area rather than others. We, we have cats also where they will choose a specific area in a house, and invariably when you, you look at the, the uh, energies in a house, that is where there's a, an energy concentration. So they seek out these, these areas, uh, and animals do. Uh, and and there's, there's other connections with birds a little bit as well. But uh, So the, there are indirect observations. They're sort of subjective in that sense, but there's definitely a link. So in terms of birds, I'm curious because we have a lot of on the islands. When I have guests come, they say, wow, you have so many birds. <laughs> and they start singing very early in the morning here. So mm -hmm. it seems like we have that here. But is it does it have to do with more of migration or where they ha end up um, nesting or landing? Um, it's it's not so much like I wouldn't I haven't looked at the migration point of view, but but the, the perhaps most obvious signs of the bird connection or when you gather in meditation on nodes, um, invariably you'll find that uh, there are local birds to the node that seem to be uh, or take a, an inordinate amount of interest above and above so the normal to watch what you do. Um, <laughs> We've had a phenomenal number of meditations on sacred sites where we're joined by the birds or individual birds calling to us. Even to the extent we were in, in, in one place a year ago with a small group of us, it was a very powerful node in Wiltshire. And every time we mentioned the word crystal, because we were looking at working on the crystalline grid at this place, uh, this nearby crow literally croaked, made, made that <laughs> Sound. And we must have said the crystal nine to ten times. And every time we said the word, it would croak. It was like there's something here that connects the birds to us and what we're doing to the location of the place, such that they were drawn to that place to do that. And the only reason they could do that is that they had some sort of sense that this place was special. Oh, that's yeah. really delightful. How fun. <laughs> When the animals and birds can join in, why not, right? It helps us. It makes us feel more connected. I think so, we've still got a lot to learn from nature. And, and I haven't mentioned about the, 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 the dolphins and, and, and the whales, but there's, and there's no proof, but there's a lot of thinking that uh, they're the ones that are looking after the nodes that are in the oceans. I believe that. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, you are a dowsing teacher. Yes, you started out or... Were you dowsing before? How did you get, was geobiology first and then dowsing or <laughs> how did that start? No, um, it started as geology. I was working at, in Southern Africa on the mines and the gold mines and um, the geologists were regularly rung up by the local farmers to come and look for water. And the, the Italian geologist called Paolo first said to me, come on Rory, we've got to look for water for this mine. It's the first introduction to this. And I thought, hmm, I'm not sure what I can do. And we pull up at the, at the farm and he pulls out some dowsing rods from his car and he says, oh, we know the water's here, Rory, we just don't know exactly where. And we proceeded to dows uh, and the water in, in limestone tends to be uh, in, in small channels, only about a foot wide. And if it's about 20, 25 meters down, it's very easy for the driller to miss. Since we arrange the drilling, we can be precise with where we want and we as we drill, we find water. And when it works all the time, you kind of think, okay, so what's going on? And uh, when I came back to this country, I came across the work of Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst and then housing the Michael and Mary line from Cornwall all the way up to East Anglia. And I wasn't far from, from that when I was living in Devon. So I thought, well, I'll go and visit one of the sites. And after about an hour, I managed to connect with these uh, energies and, uh, and, and, and get the directions for where they crossed over in this church in a place called Crediton. Um, that then, as, as a scientist, made me wonder what on earth these things were. And, and my first hypothesis was that it was to do with gravity. And uh, that was because the energy lines seemed to travel from one area of relative high ground to another. Relative high ground is a sort of like a mound in an area of, of flat plain. That, the mound is r relatively high compared to the plain. But also in, in sort of upland areas, you'll find that uh, they tend to sort of fo follow the, the hills and, and the tops, mountain tops and the valleys a little bit. So I thought that might be to do with gravity because I knew there was a lot of, lot of um, 
uh, uh, corrections made to the to the gravity data when you use gravity gravity meters to uh, assess uh, an area uh, from the point of view of its mineralogy. Um, so when you take the raw data and look at it, it was uh, was showing that there was a connection to gravity. I actually was wrong with that. But, but found out later with subsequent observations that the the side to side movement of a line which happens you know six hours one way six hours other way and different frequencies of lines that have different sort of movements but when the moon is much closer to the earth you find that the line the the, the lines are pulled further south as in the northern hemisphere so there is a gravitational influence on on the normal movements of these lines and and the more you look into these uh, observations you you, uh, you realize that there's a complete interconnectivity and a, and a larger number of, of complex interactions and influences on these energy lines and uh, it, it, although that there's this pulsing like a, from a beating heart if you like in the center of the earth this this vibrational energy is two ways a sort of standing way backwards and forwards and and it's influenced um, by energies coming into the planet as well as coming out of the planet so this is two constant two-way interplay between the energies and that now includes the the, the the position of the sun and the moon in fact there's one particular type of uh, energy line that actually alters its uh, um, side to side movement precisely at the point of the half moon it sort of stops its side to side movement and does a slight reversal and from the half moon to the full moon or the half moon to the to the, to the new moon a new sort of cycle of side to side starts and then once it's a full moon or a new moon that side to side cycle is constant all the way until the half moon stage when you get that sort of stop so you then the side to side movement is connected to the moon um, and then uh, a, a great Tadouza called Billy Gorn have identified that the lines themselves have bands within them. And these bands have different flow directions. Uh, and that was an important find because the flow directions, again, had, were two-way, predominantly either upwards to the side or down. But they had a neutral flow. And that was really quite crucial. But, but uh, I'll come to that perhaps a bit later. But the, the predominant flow of, of these uh, energies were a 360, three-dimensional 360. And I, we think now that the flow directions are connected to the movement and the spin of the Earth and the position of the planets in the solar system. So wow. that now exerts a much more an astronomical and by default consciously astrological influence on these energies and, and by default us when we're on these lines. And, and, and that... Uh, because we ourselves uh, have uh, three fields, if you like. We have an electromagnetic field, a gravitational field, and we have a vibrational field. So our collective field, just like every single object that's uh, around us, uh, which is nothing solid, it's all energy when you come down to the particles, there, there is a constant interactive uh, interaction going on between the field of the chair or whatever we're doing and our field. And for this is this is kind of like how we can douse in a way because if there's water 30 meters down, then we're familiar with the frequency and the vibrational field of that water. All we've got to do is tell our subconscious to to, to recognize that. And um, when we set up our communication between our conscious and our subconscious mind, just like asking ourselves to wake up at five in the morning, we, we program our minds to wake us up at five in the morning. And somehow when we're, our conscious is asleep and we're just in our subconscious, this command is carried out and boom, we're woken up precisely at five o'clock. So we have this way of programming and, and communicating between the conscious and the subconscious mind. And, and that for me is the essence of, of, of dowsing is that communication because the subconscious now is a connection to the universal consciousness and, and you can begin to uh, it, progress your dowsing from, from the initial just getting a yes no response with your rods it builds to a form of mediumship where where you're having a full-on communication not just with your subconscious mind with the but with the beings that that are then connected with and and it's not too far a step from mediumship to, to occur where you're having communication with ancestors and things like that but yes yes as a dowser, I, I work a lot in that field and working with the ancestral energies. But yeah. what you're saying is that um, this t 
tells us also because of this communication that we can distance dows. So I can douse from a distance from someone who, you know, for you, for instance, or someone different far from me who um, calls me to work with um, physical issues. Can that yeah. also be done with these energy currents and these energy lines? I mean, have you developed to the point where, you know, I mean, you have, but some, <laughs> some of us who can't participate and be there with you, is there a way we can tune in and to those particular energy currents? Well, yeah, yeah, the remote dowsing is uh, is a major part of my work right now. But you have to build up to that, just like you have to build up to the, to the sort of a degree of trust when it comes to moving the energy lines and repairing the nodes. Uh, I, I, that's another big subject, but it's just all a progression. You start and you you, you walk the fields and you, you find the lines and you learn from them because essentially these lines uh, are our teachers. We learn from these energies and it's the same with the uh, Gnostic Gospels and, and how they viewed the serpent in the Garden of Eden. They called it the instructor, the teacher. Yes. And when you meditate, you'll find that, 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 that you get given the information that you need you get given the challenges that you need you know they'll exploit your weaknesses they'll they'll they will, will shake you up eventually yeah. so that you progress <laughs> and you learn because you know we have we come with so much baggage and wrong associations and forethinking assumptions that we have to often have that broken down but but after a while i mean it started for me in fact I, I i came across it first by hamish miller realizing he couldn't get to a place and so he created a map of the place you could see so you didn't have to go there. He could then walk around the map on the ground, and, and he had the same sort of effect. Of, okay, well, what was up there was down here. And, yes. and if you constantly look for feedback and, and blind and double-blind experiments, and, and I used to work with another friend of mine, and, and he, he would check my work and I would check his work, and, and that would be a, a way of, of validating what we're doing is correct. So if I did some remote dowsing, if he would go and check the site, and, he, and, and his map would then can be compared with my map. Uh, so you're, if, if you keep doing that, you know you're not making it up because in dowsing, as you know, it's really easy to make it up. You just got to, you, you've got to ask that question in your focus to where state in your conscious mind, and then you've got to get rid of yourself, get rid of your ego, get rid of that, anything to do with you to move into that conscious state, a subconscious state of awareness where you are in a no mind state. You're, you're not thinking of one thing, you're not feeling one thing, you're feeling everything. And that, and, and you're not seeing, you're seeing everything, seeing periphery view. So you're in, in that completely divorced state in your subconscious where, to be honest, you don't care. All you're interested in is the truth, the fire to know what is really there because you don't want to waste your time. Right. And w when, when you do that, wonderful things begin to start emerging because then you start getting thoughts and symbols flashing in your head and you think, where do they come from? And they'll have a relevance to what you're doing. And in remote dowsing, one of the wonderful ways of getting feedback is um, if you if you find on the large scale maps, for instance, when you look on the large scale maps, you, you I, I will mark out the cities, if you like, over a sort of 200 kilometer square radius. And I'll know the line is heading towards it some way but I don't quite know where. So I'll, I'll start on a large scale and there may be two lines coming into it and I'll, I'll be within, you know, 20, 30 kilometers of accuracy and I'll, I'll narrow the area down and then I'll get a smaller scale. And I, instead of the 200 square miles, I'll be looking at, you know, maybe 20 square miles, that sort of thing. And I'll narrow it down again after that, wondering all the time where this node is going to be. And, um, the number of times you, you keep narrowing it down, you realize, wow, where you come up with what you find is just absolutely shocking. I, I did this in fact uh, back in 2012, where I was looking for the, um, the 24 most powerful second order nodes. Um, and I was tracking it, the pair of emperor dragons down through Africa and they were heading towards Angola. And just in, inland from the coast, there was this uh, river. And it looked like their lines were crossing in a strong node by the side of this river. It's a river, Kwanza, I think it is, in, in Angola, if anyone knows it. I'm thinking, I wonder why they, they're crossing over there with this Type 4 alignment. And, and, and so I zoom in and I find there's a small little habitation right on the banks of, of this, uh, this river. Uh, and it's a little, little township called um, um, Maxima, is its name. 
And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. There's obviously people there, and I'm zooming in, and oh, there's a church, you know, a church to Our Lady. So I think, oh, well, that's probably where the node is. And it's just thinking, it's people praying at the church. And when you start looking into it, you, you Google the church, and you think, oh, my goodness. 1855, because this is an old Portuguese colonial area. In 1855, someone had a visitation from a Marian apparition, you know, just like the Lord's. This place has a million visitors a year locally. It's an annual pilgrimage site. And I'm, I'm totally blown by this. I think, well, I had never, no idea. And yet this has come emerged from remote viewing and remote, remote housing. I thought, well, you know, you couldn't make that up. So that's my feedback. So when I have that feedback from my remote housing, I think, well, okay, I must have, I must have that that time got it right. So that's, <laughs> that's quite useful. And, and um, well, there's probably another example we'll come to later, actually, which I'll mention. Well, can, um, you sort of glossed through this idea of the emperor line, so maybe we should talk about those a little bit. Um, can you tell me about those? Yeah, this was this um, again. For me, I, I basically, as a scientist, when you're not sure what's going on, you just make observations. And you just keep making observations till you can form a hypothesis. And I tried the one with gravity, it didn't work. Uh, and then with further um, observations, I've decided to map a whole area in northern Wiltshire where I, where I was of, of a particular type of line. And um, I progressed just by making observations. And as a leader, I knew uh, actually not far from where it was in Devon, in, in Crediton. Uh, and we became friends. She was one of the world's scientifically tested healers. So I've been blessed with meeting some incredible people in my life. And, 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 and Carol Everett, her name, uh, was flown to Denki University in, in, in Tokyo, where she was just literally going to be tested for a medical intuitive ability. And she was wired up to an EEG machine and, and this uh, uh, patient who'd been diagnosed that morning. Uh, and her, her job, Carol, was to try and uh, medically in intuitive what was wrong with this lady. And uh, within seconds, Carol said, oh, I, I can tell you've got a tumor in your ovary. And the professor, Yoshi Machi from the University, Denki University, said, oh, we've flown you three and a half thousand miles. We've hardly got any seconds of footage in your brainwave activity. And Carol turned around and said, no, I can get rid of it. At a distance of, of two meters all the time, and you can see, uh, well, she, she wasn't in the same room as the thermal imagery scan, but on the thermal imagery scan, this is live filmed, live TV for by Fuji TV, and they're filming it. You can see the red area where the tumor is, and it's just disappearing slowly and slowly into background blue. Seven minutes that this tumor was gone, and she's, she gets rid of tumors or has done for, for years. It's the most amazing thing. But that was the first time any healer has been filmed in live TV conditions in a laboratory healing someone's tumor. Anyway. Carol lived on this type four energy line, Michael and Mary line in Crediton. And I knew, knew she was there because I knew this, the, her sanctuary where she did the healing was right on the Mary line, which is one of the most powerful lines we ever thought. I mean, we didn't really know much then. And I thought, well, obviously she can, she can, she can heal on these lines, but she, I learned from that that actually, although she works on that line, she doesn't need to be there anymore. She can still be a great healer when she's not on the lines. And, and, and the wonderful thing we want about meditation is we can meditate on these really powerful sites, but we don't always have to be there. We can meet even online when we're all separate. But because that group was once at that powerful node, we can recreate the same power in that online group as we were actually in real time face to face at that node. So just because... And this is what it kind of breaks down your, your, your barriers so that you can get to that higher level. So just because Carol had worked for many years on the, on the, on this type four energy, like the Mary line, she didn't have to be on it anymore, but that, that wasn't it. What, what was, what was quite strange was uh, they decided to go and live in Spain. And at the same time, um, she, she rang me about, no, about three, about three or four months after she'd been down there. She said, Rory, she says, I've just found this incredible place in the mountains. The energies there are off the scale. I'm going, off the scale? You've been living on the, the most powerful line that we know of. Now, what on earth does that mean? Off the scale. And, and no, it's much bigger than Devon. She said, really? I said, and at that same point, there's a French medium called Brigitte Ricks uh, um, who'd sent some information to Ron and I. Ron was a scientist who came up with this new idea. And, and we, we 
I mean, we, neither of us were aware of uh, Jane Roberts's work channeling uh, Seth and, and uh, this bestseller 1970s book, uh, Seth Speaks, The True Nature of Reality. And she sent some sections to this because it supported his scientific basis behind the universe and the creation of the universe. But she, she, she sent me some things which was mentioned in there because Seth talked about the four absolute coordinate points, places of greatest power in the world. Oh, which when there were there were exhibitions back in, in the 70s to try and find where these absolute coordinate points were on the world. Now this had me quite slightly confused because if there had been two places in the world, that would have been two lines going around the world, and yeah, the way they cross over, you know, two points. As soon as you introduce a third great circle like line, you either have those two positions again, because all three lines run through those two positions, or you've got six points, which you can't have four. I don't think, well, how can you have four? <laughs> and it took a while before realizing actually the, the two are, the, he was slightly encoding what he was saying because he was talking about ones that were for, for mankind. The other two were in the oceans. So oh. this happened at the same time as Carol then releases this information to me that, uh, uh, well, actually, there's something even more powerful. And then another healing friend of mine, Manik, who has this huge healing sanctuary in, in Kerala in India, I've taken him to Avery before. He's the only person I've ever met who can see these energies. I've heard other people can as well, obviously, but um, he, he then told me he was going on this circumnavigation uh, and the circumambulation of Mount Kailash. And he told me about Mark Kylex being the most incredibly powerful and, and, and his energies were emanating all over the place. So I kind of figured this more, if there's going to be one point, then Mark Kylex is going to be one of those absolute co coordinate points, which, which Seth was describing was where the things which were being created in, in the world, world birthplace of new ideas and things. So I thought, well, the, the, and his description of the absolute coordinate points were just spot on for notes. It's the same thing. And it had to be these more powerful lines. So I, I started in, in, uh, in Spain, really trying to find out where these, these emperor dragons were. And it took me eight months to, to, to track them remotely around the world. And I eventually found the four places in the world. And this was leading up to December 2021. Uh, and, and, uh, 2012, sorry, which was quite an important date in the diary. Everyone thought that sort of uh, big things and changes would happen in December uh, uh, 2012. And in the earlier part of the year, we just managed to, to sort of find where these lines were. But one of the, the lines in Spain, they, they, they weren't crossing over in the right place. They, they, they did a tic-tac-toe. In other words, you've got a noughts and crosses sort of thing. So the, the lines used to be all in one place, and they weren't. And I got, I got this information that I had to, to repair it. I had to get this node repaired, but I couldn't do it on my own. So, and I had six weeks to do it. <laughs> At that point, I didn't have any money to do it either. And if you want to read what happened then, you read my book, Grail Bound, but the people just appeared and it was just the most amazing thing. But the, the point was, that's how the Emperor Dragons came about. We found out where they were. And, and, uh, and, and since we found they were a different type of line from the other energy lines, and it appears that these had galactic sources. Yeah. So the, the, the galactic energy came from outside the solar system, uh, and it's a really cosmic energy that, that hits our atmosphere, uh, it splits into gamma rays and neutrinos. And neutrinos are the uh, high energy particles that uh, go through to the inner core and part energy into the inner core. And that's what's transduced and forms more spher spherical vibrations on the surface, producing the for dragon lines. Sorry so, for waffling all of it. <laughs> so, he, so hearing these lines, um, first of all, noticing one that it needed to be healed, something must have told you or you felt it and then two healing them kind of reminds me a little bit of are you moving them so you know when when we want to divert water we can we can divert water to a well right so is is it similar to that like moving the line or are you just repairing the path you're, you're moving the line you're, you're I mean, to begin with when we started to doing this we literally walk the lines to where they're supposed to be but you can actually call the lines to you as well uh, and you can do it remotely you can repair things remotely and it's very much a degree of trust and, and, and familiarity but the thing with the emperor dragons is you couldn't do it on your own you need other people to do it they won't let you do it on your own how did you know it was 
needed healing and moving. Well, I've been doing a lot of work on nodes and and in, in the UK and 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 when you repair nodes and you get, I mean, I wasn't the first person to do a repair of a node. I, I just noticed what some, uh, Hamish had done. And, and uh, that led me to understanding the mechanics of how you do this. And, and essentially what the most important thing is what good looks like, because I didn't know. So when you start calling all the lines that should be at a node to be at the node and any that shouldn't be at the node to not be at the node and, and, and you do various things, but you then look at what you have afterwards. And it's then that you appear that what, what appears is this incredible symmetry. You need equal numbers of the pairs of lines coming together. If you have the wrong numbers or the wrong pairs, that that needs to be repaired. And, and lines are easily moved away. Any intense negative emotion in the in the nearby area will, will will shift a line away from it. But once you have the symmetry, the three-dimensional energy shape at the node is very is cylindrical. And the cylinder as a containment field is absolutely vital so that when you have the interacting uh, bands of, of flow directions and they're neutral, when you have two neutral intersections, you get tiny little vortices appearing. And, and at sacred sites today, the vortices pop up all over the place, but only when you've got the containment field do these tiny vortexes come together into a big, large vortex. And this is exactly what happens with water. You know, when you have the water tornadoes and things like that, you need that containment field of high pressure so the small vortices can build to a large vortex. And, when, and four times a year, when all the energies are in harmony and you've got neutral flow, you get these massive vortexes building inside these cylinders of energy at the node. Such, so such strong suction from the vortex that it collapses the cylinder of energy into a double torus, two vortex rings. And that's what opens the gate and the portals. And it's that vortex ring movement that, uh, and this is a real leap ahead in, in understanding, so is, is that we are our, body, our own bodies and our own vortex rings and our energetic aura around us and our, and our vortex rings in, in the left ventricle of our heart. This is what we have to create resonance with the, the Earth's uh, vortex rings. And when you create a resonance with the vortex rings, all sorts of crazy, amazing stuff can begin to happen. Uh, I uh, had a, um, I was, thank you for that. I was invited to um, Sedona, Arizona to learn water dowsing from one of the prominent water dowsers in the U.S. <clears throat> and his house was two miles away from the airport vortex. And apparently every 30 seconds it would go up and then it would come down. And then, and I did not know that. I didn't sleep for five days. I think I woke up and my hair was, you know, on end. And I couldn't figure out why I was so energized. And I feel like I was invited there under the guise of learning well dowsing. But actually, I feel like I got some kind of an upgrade or a download or <laughs> while I was there and literally didn't sleep for five days. But I was so energized, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was really the, a fascinating, the area. Yeah. It was a fascinating it, it experience, fascinating. I have to say. That yeah. was my first. <laughs> well, if you just, just think energetically, a vortex of energy is just, just going to completely you know, cleanse your own whole system, isn't it? It's going to go yes. just go literally go straight through you and rewire you and, and, and uh, alter everything. So, uh, And, of course, that's what everyone needs right now. It was great yeah. fun, but, you know, I, I didn't choose it on purpose. <laughs> it was a higher consciousness concept, I think. My, they were when, when you start connecting with the subconscious, you begin to wonder what life you have left of your own because you end yeah. up. <laughs> right. You just do what you're told. You know? Right, right. So the power of these um, energy lines, currents, um, there are different categories. I know you spent a lot of time categorizing these different lines. Um, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, they're just yeah. different frequencies. That's different all. The side movements uh, uh, are varied a little bit. The, the, the character of the of the movements vary a little bit. Uh, the um, the widths tend to vary a bit. Uh, and the, the, the the rare and the rarity. The emperor, dra the big emperor dragons. We found three, but then since two thousand and eighteen, three more have appeared. And that's another story, but um, the, they're rare. And then the type four lines, like the Michael and Mary line, they're also pretty rare. 
I mean, there's only about 12 to 13 pairs across the UK. Uh, but then you've got a much more common type three lines, type two and type one, and they're the smaller frequencies. They, they, they move slightly faster. So you can, you can differentiate them. Um, and, as, and as soon as you can differentiate them, you can begin to understand uh, how their differences make up. One of the, the big problems for years was if there's so many energy lines, why isn't the sacred sites everywhere? And, and then not at every single intersection. But it turns out where you've got the larger energy lines, they draw the smaller lines in. And when you've got that effect and a really powerful node exists and you don't have so many nearby, and uh, that, that explains why uh, some of the, for instance, like the, the Knights Templar didn't build chapels everywhere, but they built them on the very most important nodes, like in, in Chartres and, and other places like, like that. So there's uh, the differentiation of, of, of between the types of lines helped us begin to understand the more powerful sites and the less powerful sites. So the, when the Emperor Dragons cross over, we call them the First Order nodes, like the one we've had in Spain. Um, for, for me now, the, the thing is to find the major lines where they intersect and get people to them. So, sorry, I'm waffling on. <laughs> so, I would like to I would like to correlate the emperor these emperor dragon lines, the, the the bigger lines that have a more of an impact for us in our consciousness and our awakening. And I've read I read your last newsletter. Um, and there's something you feel like this is this energy that we're in where we're in this conscious awakening. Um, the dragon lines are there to help us. Is this correct? And two, yeah. um, uh, 2024 is when you see things beginning to shift. Is there a label? What is this time between now and then? <laughs> Cause I can tell you what I feel, but <laughs> it's yeah, a little chaotic. Okay, well, we, we're, we definitely seem to go through a transition zone. Well, the, the, the 2024 came about in a couple of ways. As, as I mentioned earlier, sort of December 2017, January 20, 2018, and then the last Emperor Dragon, the sixth one, arrived around July 2018. Uh, everything around that time seemed to sort of burst into expansion. All the energy lines doubled in width. And... Um, I asked other people around to just just what, tell me what you find with the energy lines. So some huge influx of energy had started at that point. But the, the fourth energy line, the Emperor Dragon, we found running north to south, pole to pole. And um, it, it's, it, it was just, well, that's where it was. And, and that seemed to coincide with the Hopi Indian Blue Kachina prophecy, which is when the arrival of the twins occurred. Uh, and this is the, the god of the North Pole and the god of the South Pole called uh, Palangahoya and uh, Perganghoya, uh, the grandmother spiders and grandsons, I think they are. And, 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 and the, the Hopi Indian prophecy is when they arrive, it'll be seven years uh, before the uh, Red Star purification comes in, so it's the light of purification. I mean, okay, so I, mean, I, I, I can't say anything about the seven years. That took us to... 2024, but but what corroborated a little bit was in, at the same time in in, in 2017, these uh, these energy lines, all these energy lines seem came into harmony. All their side to side movements, when you measure them every day for 18 months, which I did for except for about 12 lines, and every time I took the dog out, I would measure where the lines were and, and check hourly, and we found that four times a year, all the energy lines moved in harmony. And they would stay in harmony for about half a day, three quarters of a day. And they were always on the day before the solstices and the equinoxes, which really threw me out because I thought, well, why aren't they on the solstices and the equinoxes? And further studies was shown that actually the, the first day of the sun cycle was the solstice and the equinox. And that was known as a day of celebration, like the Feast of St. John for the summer solstice. But the ancient Hebrew holy day was on the last day of the sun cycle. It's called the Teku first, the last day of the cycle. And the last day of the sun cycle was always the day before the solstices and equinoxes. And now that Hebrew holy day, which they probably got from the Bronze Age before that, but 
that's when all the lines were in harmony. And when they were in harmony, they all had mutual flow. And that's when the double Tauruses came. So that they happened four times a year. We used to do meditations, you know, back in 2012 on the sacred sites in, in Wiltshire and, and start these groups, which to begin with had four or five people. Now we're getting 150 people at some of these sites, some of these, which is, which is great news. But since 2017, the harmony time went from about three quarters of a day to a day and a half. And then it progressed to three days, then six days. Now it's 15 days long. And the jumps are getting bigger. And you can extrapolate out the fact that if these harmony times ex get exponentially faster and faster, as they say, longer and longer, by December 2024, they're going to be 96 days long, which, of course, means four of those is all year round. So you're going to have all year round Taurus double towards the vortex ring at this mm -hmm. and, and that's like there's one fundamental frequency from the center of our earth that that beating drum is just pumping out at very low frequency it's actually 72 hours 36 hours one way 36 hours but it's like this massive we've had a massive great hit on a dong on, on, a, on a bell in the center of our earth and it's just going dong, you know <laughs> and um that that is for me the point where we the stability of that vibration means that when we chant when we make sounds it will be that much easier to create actual vibrational resonance at these sites with our own body's vibrations. And so when, we, when we've cracked the resonance, sorry, that's, that's when we, we, we build the, the connection between the conscious and subconscious, much more. So for those of us that aren't able to access the lines that you have there, how do we, how do we participate in this awakening for ourselves? How do we well, the, find our own sacred sites? How do we survive the, the next? <laughs> okay. Well, the beautiful <laughs> thing about these, these emperor dragons, actually, is that the cosmic energy that comes from outer space actually bounces off our sun. And the sun is what also drives the source behind the type four energy lines. And, and the reason why all these lines widened is because the central band is what widened and the central band is linked to the sun. So when you get more cosmic energy from from the galactic sources bouncing off the sun and that central band has widened. You're now in every single energy line, there's the essence of the emperor dragon in the central band. So mm. we don't need to be on the emperor dragons. We just need to be on the type four lines and where they're intersecting and in any intersection of the node, because that's that essence of the emperor dragon is in everywhere. And remember, it's not, a, it's not a line, it's a field. So you're tapping into the field frequency. And it's got such dominance that we only have to be on a sacred site to have it to feel its, 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 its connection. Because at the harmony times, we're connecting with all the vibrational fields, including the highest level ones, which the emperor dragon are. So for, for my role, it's been about, well, I need to get the information for where these sacred sites are to local people. And, and I've been mapping them for, for years now. I'm, I've I've finished mapping the main lines in, in the UK and in Ireland. I've nearly finished France and Spain and Portugal. I'm, I've done most of Belgium and, and uh, Denmark and Holland, starting on Germany, a bit of Italy. Um, I've done bits in Australia. I've done a lot of work in America, me measuring where these lines are. And, of course, the, the last um, pair of Emperor Dragons to arrive run through coast to coast from America. Coast to coast. Might, yeah, they, they run from roughly Monterey, uh, all the way centrally across to um, uh, the area around Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And um, they, they go through. You're talking about Monterey, California. Yeah, yeah. And, and just a bit south of that, there's, there's a place called uh, Jade Cove. Um, and and um, where they run, uh, they, they cross some incredibly ancient, uh, ancient Native American sites. Uh, and of course, from from um, when they leave Monterey and, that, and, and, and a place we call Jade Node, they cross the Pacific and then they head towards the Hawaiian Islands. Yes, which might be might be more interesting. Uh, yeah. So that was quite when, when the sixth emperor arrived. We we did this sort of massive. All right, we've got to find out where this was. And um, there was some massive synchronicity with a friend of mine called David Alexander English, who's a, a Native American who lives in Venice Beach. We, we met actually in um, in the year 1999 on the top of Silbury Hill in England in a thunderstorm. 
in the afternoon and we found out it was the actually equinox day as well so we had two hours of conversation not always in the thunderstorm we went went down to the, the but we, we, we created this whole idea of the evolution day consciousness of consciousness we knew it was happening at that point so we, we've been working towards the evolution of consciousness in, in, in all that time and a couple of years ago i went to see him over in, in, in california we, we kept we kept up but he, he'd spent ages years in the Kauai. Okay, so he knew the area I was talking about because we back we we, we tracked the area. Um, and he he was he'd actually told me about a very special place up in in California, where he knew an ancient Hopi Indian site was. He calls it the observatory, and it has since been recognised as such. And, and that's exactly where the Emperor Dragon returned. Because the thing I should mention about these Emperor Dragons is the source of the galactic energy comes and goes over time depending on whether or not this energy can get through to our atmosphere. What stops the cosmic energy is the interstellar magnetic fields. But now the magnetic fields of the Earth are coming down, this galactic energy can come through. It's like the, the clouds have disappeared and the sixth sun comes through. So if you think of six suns, and we've only had three for a while, the clouds have gone, the electromagnetic clouds have gone, and we're now going to use six galactic sources. So these, these, these emperor dragons come and go over the centuries. And there was evidence on the land when the Hopi, the ancestors of Hopi were there, that, that, that this was where it last, it was last, and this is where it returned again. And uh, so he was, he, he, he's been looking after that area and, and, and what, going to the nodes and arranging people to, to know about them in that place. So we're constantly looking for people at these sacred sites to be aware of them and to build communities. Uh, and that's, that's why I started something called the Sacred Network, which was a new website which we're, we're building at the moment to get this information so people can form groups local to where these nodes are and uh, and prepare themselves for whatever is coming with regards to the, these changing energies. Mm. But uh, the the thing about the, I, I was going to mention, might as well, that these emperor dragons run through some incredibly sacred sites that all have been in existence for years. And um, I was always interested. That, and we have one yeah, that runs on. through Hawaiian Islands. Yes, right? Yeah, in our island. Yeah, it, it, one of them, one of them just goes straight between a couple of the main islands and misses everything. But the other one just clips the northwest corner of Kauai. And I won't right. mention it there, but anyone who knows the northwest sacred sites, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's, it runs through that particular site, if you know. Okay. So that, that, that protects it for a little bit. From the side. But, but a lovely story about, about that was um, – uh, two and a half years ago, I was uh, just just literally after this this emperor dragon had arrived and I'd mapped it. Uh, I received a call from a lovely couple who were living in Carlsbad, and they said, well, "We want to know how to know what you do. You know, we've got a group of people. Can you come over and join uh, and train us to do this?" Uh, and I, I checked them out on the website, and I'd seen they were on retreats on on Kauai. And I said, "I hear you, you, I wanted to tell them about the Emperor Dragon that that, that, that was growing there because I, I knew they were going back." And I said, "You know, um, next, and I, I see you run retreats on, on Kauai. I said, I want to tell you about a place that next time you go there, I said you've got to visit this place." And I told them where it was, and they said, "Oh my goodness, we've only just been come back from that place." We were at that site two weeks ago. And I said, well, it, it, it only just arrived about four weeks ago. I, he said, we, I know. We looked up in the sky. There was fire, like fireworks going off. We didn't know it was midnight. We were in the mid, in this place. and came up afterwards, and it was, it was just all in the sky. We couldn't believe what was going on. And I was about to tell them about that site, thinking it was new. And they'd experienced it two weeks before the actual oh. arrival of this dragon. And, uh, and other, they're very spiritual, connected people. And he, so that was enough to very, then very kindly pay for my wife and I to, to go out there and work, work with them for a while. So oh. little, little things like that to, to, to sort of round it off, know that, yep, yeah, you know, that's what will happen, you know. That's, uh, yeah. So were so we very, very the, So now I'm going to have to take a road trip. <laughs> <laughs> over here a boat trip um yeah i i i feel like we've covered so much ground there's so much more to discuss than really uh, is. Yeah. but one of the things that i i want to ask you is how 
for those of us, again, who aren't on these lines, what can we do? What can we do until we get to those lines? What do you suggest? Gathering, meditation? Well, if you can learn to douse, uh, learn to connect from the conscious mind to your subconscious mind, uh, uh, you don't actually have to be anywhere to this. Just learn to, to focus and get intense focus in your conscious mind and then switch. The key is the switching from intense focus to intense awareness. And then go into that sort of no mind state where you can then uh, be receptive to whatever you get given. Because technically the field is everywhere. If you can douse, it's the same as you ask the question and you, and, and you go into that aware state and you'll get the response with the rod or, or with your fingers or whichever, or the pendulum, which way you do that. So you can practice that, learn to douse. I, I didn't expect to be doing all this. I just was curious about the this key chi energy and i just literally self-taught reading a book so anyone can do this and there's lots of videos on, on how to start but if you douse you can walk from your house and begin to find an energy and when you do you you can follow it or go to another sacred site that you know of and, and practice learning around that site because that, that's how everyone like myself and, and the early ones we just taught ourselves to, to find this and we we we, we get taught by these energies. That's literally it. They are the instructor, and you become sort of the, the person who just listens to that. So that's my advice. Do that first, and, and, and it'll take you on your journey of discovering which is right for you rather than reliving mine or someone else's life and doing what I'm doing. You, you, the, the, the wonderful thing about where we're heading is that we're into completely unknown territory. We don't even know the questions to ask. But what we do know is what Steiner talks about, we're moving from individual consciousness to group consciousness. So what we did on our own is not going to work anymore. We need to start working in groups. And that means recognising our, our individual strengths. Because when we do that, then we can really start learning. I mean, spirits, I have a quote from you here. Spiritual awakenings okay. are not usually pleasant. <laughs> Often they feel like confusion, frustration, anger, despair, sadness, and grief. They are uncomfortable and challenging as they are intense time of personal growth. And then on the upside, you said, also a quote, humanity heads towards our evolution of consciousness. As humanity heads towards our evolution of consciousness, we will, we will need to feel the freedom in order to make the right choices in life to change who we are now to who we need to be in the near future. And, and learning about and working with these lines feels like a pathway to do that as an individual. Finding these sites, meditating with them. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I can add a little bit to that. The, um, what we seem to be collectively going through is uh, it's not just a transition of, of us and mankind. It's, it's all humanity, all, all the beings of all the world. This is something which is bringing all the different matter frequency worlds together in one. And the journey from our physical world to the land of spirit has often been uh, done through incubatory journeys, uh, through uh, uh, great people in the past like Jung and Steiner and Goethe, a lot of people have made these shamanic like journeys and, and what you what you experience in, in doing this crossing of this abyss that Steiner calls about it is you're entering into the realms of the subconscious where you are be you are typically challenged and tested your weaknesses are, are are confronted in order for you to to have that extension of consciousness across to the world of spirit you need to be tested because you need to have your your weaknesses strengthened and and Jung himself, for instance, when he, when he read his red book and what he went through, he was tested for his full thinking, his his associations that serpents were evil, his his thought, his theory of the opposite, which he thought was linked to duality, which she eventually agreed wasn't. But it, 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 this whole challenge when he meets the spirit of the depths, the spirit of the times, and, and Steiner's guardian of the threshold, that challenge in the abyss is what we're collectively going through right now. As the worlds come together, we're all being forced on this human, human, mankind, shamanic incubatory journey. So we're all being tested, and that is to strengthen us. 
and this is what the Hopi talk about, it's what the prophecies talk about, uh, in order to, to, to reach that point where we can be purified. Uh, uh, well, it's it's a gradual process, and that's literally what's happening right now. But throughout that process, the most important thing is our choice. We have to feel free to decide to accept the challenge in an environment which is not free, uh, and we don't have a choice. That steps against the whole uh, process of growth in the universe. It's like a universal law. Uh, the one thing common to all life is that it grows. And the only way you can grow is physically, mentally, and spiritually. So that is the choice that we have to make ourselves to become a better person. And people, you call it the path of individuation. It's called the Cathar path, the Grail path. It's the sacred path that we can choose to come on. We must make that choice. And, and liberty needs to exist for us to make that choice. Uh, but mankind are, right, are going through this. And the, and the awakening that we're talk, talking about is that people are realizing that actually you know, they're awakening to the realization that we have this choice to improve, to come together. To, to prepare ourselves, uh, embracing this, this new cosmic wave. The cosmic wave, cosmic waves are, are naturally evolutionary. They mutate the cells inside us. So they're re reactivating the dormant genes inside us. They're, they're making us feel more empathy, more telepathy, uh, more clear audience. They are uh, bringing us together in ways which we, we haven't felt in, in mankind for 12,000 years properly. Uh, and it's, it, it, that, that's that's the excitement of where we're heading. You know, sorry, I haven't do to waffle on. I'm sorry. No, that's wonderful. I just want I wanted to try and you know label this next couple of years. You know, surviving purification. <laughs> See, <laughs> that feels. I liken it to riding a wave. We got to learn to ride a wave. Yeah, we have to. And, and that wave is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, it's time to learn to surf. Yes. Oh, well, it's been delightful, Rory. I've, I've taken up a lot of your time. I really appreciate that. I have one thing I want to mention. In the end of your May, June newsletter, which was about the heart, um, yeah. and you mentioned songs, I feel like you have this inner rocker going. You know, you mentioned all like Leonard Skinner's Freebird. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> that, um, that newsletter definitely was a theme of music. Yes. <laughs> anyway, you referred to your Scottish heritage with um, John Farnham playing with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. You are the voice. And um, I just want to know, do you play the bagpipes? Well, <laughs> it's a funny old story there. I did go to school in Scotland up to the age of 13. And I did learn to play the chanter. The chanter is the bottom part of the pipes. So half of me can say, well, I, I started learning to play the bagpipes, but I didn't get to the bag part. I was quite small at the time. Um, but I, I know how to play a few things on the chanter. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm not I'm not at the skill level of even beginning to to work with the bagpipes, but I do love the chanter. <laughs> it's, it's just fantastic. And uh yeah, I, I, I got a new kilt last year as well. So that, oh, I'm looking good. forward to it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate that. We wanted to bring that in. And the video that you attached to that email um, for that um, particular performance with the Melbourne Symphony is spectacular. And I encourage the audience to sign up for um, Rory's newsletters they um two months packed into one newsletter it's quite a read but they're entertaining and informative mm -hmm. and i very much appreciate the information that you're putting out for us thank you so much they're both free on the website you just go to roryduff.com and go to newsletters and you can read back i don't know how many 12 30 40 maybe 60 like but uh, keep you busy for hours. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for and I this. And you also have a book that consolidates 200 of your blog posts, which um, I'm in the process of reading. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a free um, PDF download. Um, and that's the first 200 posts. But if you go onto the link on my Instagram uh, uh, account there and, and on the Facebook page, which is another 200 posts. 
uh, actually. So there's double the amount, which is free. You just got to click on the link, and um, that, that, that's a, a merry old goose chase, which takes you around lots of things and dives down rabbit holes you won't believe. Um, <laughs> had a great, great fun putting that all together. Yeah. And the Grail Bound book. Also, I would recommend those that are interested in that. Um, there's lots of wonderful. Yeah, please, please do buy the books. But if you want to look at a free video, the, the Holy Grail Found video is, is is free to watch. It's got about nearly half a million views, which is about the what the Templars did and, and that, how they find their lines and they were tracking these straight alignments and coming across the intersections like a Chartres. But there's three sites there. One place is just a remarkable place in the south of France, which is so powerful inside this Templar chapel. I mean, I've, I've spoken to read people living only 50 miles away, French people, all their life they don't know about this chapel. Oh. It's, it's just unknown. And then the, the symbols on the ceiling are just, ah, yes. oh, Yeah, I love, that's a wonderful documentary, and the symbols were just amazing. Yeah. And, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the other site in, in Spain, with that window, with all these different, different symbols in there, that yes. site as a place to visit is just phenomenally powerful. And it's one of the top five most most holy places in the Christian world, apparently. And another site for, for miracles and pilgrimages. And yet, outside of the region, no one's heard of it. I, might, I keep thinking, how many other places in the world? It's been quietly emanating its beautiful yeah. harmony. Yeah. So but, but, are you going to be leading any more uh, trips in the future? Are you planning any other pilgrimages? Um, you know, I, I want, I've got people wanting to go back to Spain. I had a really great, successful group there. I want to take more people to Spain. I, I, I would love to go over and do a, a, a tour of sites in America next to these, connected to these uh, emperor dragons and some incredibly powerful places we've been finding in America. I'd like to go visit them as well. Um, and there's, there, there will be others, but um, I'm, I'm not prepared to put up with the nonsense at the moment with traveling. Yes, yes, understood, <laughs> understood. And you'll yeah, be teaching yeah. as well, right? You're teaching. Uh, anyone who wants to, yes, <laughs> to learn, definitely. Yeah, uh, that, 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 there's an important thing that we've got to, to, to get across. It's not just people finding where these nodes are and so they can come around and meditate on them, but they've got to know how to look after the nodes. That, unfortunately, means you've got to learn how to douse accurately. You've got to learn how to move the lines and keep the nodes intact. And, and, and uh, there's an awful lot of other aspects because it's not just the energies. It's, it's the whole interaction that goes with it. So there's a lot of learning we must do. Um, and that's, have, you done that's a video, a, have you done a video on this for a remote for anyone who might want to start? Not for not for the nodes. That that's on, on my cards for the end of the year is to put something together uh, to help people learn more about nodes, um, and, and 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 then large vortexes, which are different from nodes. I'm very briefly tell the, the large vortexes are when all the energies of one type of line come together. But the nodes, the difference is that you've got different types of energy lines coming together. Uh, in Sedona, the large vortexes, for instance, at the airport node, I think it's a, a connection of type one lines there. So you've got four pairs of type one lines there. And the reason, the, the main difference is because that means the, the energetic action is more regular at that place because of that, mm. just because that one, 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 one type of energy uh, and, and there are other uh, vortexes of different energy types in, in, in uh, the, uh, the Boynton node there is. What uh, Boynton vortex is a type three vortex, which is, uh, and there's another one, I forget the name of it. Um, but at the nodes, you've got type fours, threes, twos, and ones all, all coming together. And that's a combination of different free fields of frequency. And you get a different flavor. And one of the things I find interesting is that in, in, uh, in America, there's a greater number of vortexes compared to in Europe, where there's a greater number of, of nodes. So this is the ancestors would look after and want a particular type of node or, or, rather than a vortex. And the Native American Indians, I think, were more used to working with vortexes as opposed to nodes, because each one it, we're beginning to recognize as a slightly different function, as you perhaps, perhaps expect. And those the vortexes, I'm only aware of the ones in Arizona, but I'm sure there are others. 
Oh, I found some really powerful ones in um, the Prior Mountains uh, in Montana. And also some, there's an area in uh, Colorado that I know that I've mapped uh, some pretty powerful type three vortexes. So there, there are others that exist. Um, yeah, so that, 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 that will, information will slowly be put on the maps in the uh, Sacred Network site when it's up in a few months' time. Okay, so. right. And Sacred Network site is, you can find it through uh, roryduff.com. It's a, you're working on it. It hasn't come live yet. But no, we, we, we raised a, a wonderful 15,000 pounds in, in under seven weeks, which is just tremendous, which is more than we needed. But it's it's uh, it's in in development right now. It's about to be migrated onto the blockchain, uh, an encrypted network, so that anything you write there is going to be uh, completely confidential. There's going to be groups you can join. You can create events. You can join up other groups. You can uh, have there's discussion forums. You can you can uh, write on and public and private forums. It's a big it'd be a great meeting place for spiritual minded people that want to meditate around these nodes, and you want to know where they are. Um, so that, that's what it's basically fun. wonderful well thank you again no thank you thank i'm gonna you. say warmest alohas and um <laughs> more <laughs> you can find rory um at rorydeff.com right? yeah. linda thank you very much for Excellent. a very enjoyable time thank you very much thank you